Yo, what up everybody? This is gonna be the first video of the Kitty Corner and the market has kind of forced my hand on this one. The first stock that I'm gonna talk about is GameStop and I know it's a polarizing stock. Some people won't even tune into the stream right now when they hear that I'm bullish on GameStop uh, at the current price point. It's trading about four bucks right now, $260 million market cap. And I, most of these kitty corner videos, I want them to be shorter, like one minute, five minute, 10 minute max. I want them to, uh, so that way it's just a quick intro into uh, my thoughts on a stock. But this GameStop one, it's gonna be a little bit longer because um, I have a lot to say about it. I could talk about it for weeks. I'm gonna try to keep this as short as I possibly can, but I have a lot to say. I'm also hoping maybe you can catch some of my blind spots if I have some, poke some holes in my thesis and share it with me because um, yeah, I think everyone else is crazy and I think I'm right, but I've been wrong plenty of times in the past. So I'm gonna upload this and maybe you can share your thoughts with me, but uh, yeah, let's dive in. GameStop, okay, here we are. So like I said, this video is gonna be a little bit on the longer side for a kitty corner video. So if you drink, you might want one of these for this. It's July, 2020 right now, and I'm bullish on GameStop at the current price point of about $4 per share. $260 million market cap. I've been adding to the position the past couple weeks. It's been trading below $4 per share, and it's now the largest position in the Roaring Kitty model portfolio. So um, yeah, I have a lot to say about it. I've been I've been tracking it for a while. I know it's a divisive stock, so definitely share your, your, your thoughts with me on this, whether you agree with me or not, I'm curious to hear. Um, and because I have so much to say about this, I had to put together this word doc just to help guide the conversation because I'd be all over the place because I, uh, with without this guidance. So I tried to just focus on what I consider the more important aspects, um, to, and just boil it into a single word doc here. But, uh, yeah, we'll just, we'll just see how this goes. But before we kick things off some recommended reading, in fact, I can save you the trouble of watching this video because my bull thesis has already been covered by so many other folks. I'm kind of just, I'm just sharing with you my viewpoint, but everything that every aspect of my thesis, people have already talked about. So, um, if you read these things, these recommended things, you won't need to watch this video. So if you check out Scion's letters to the board and just their commentary on things, uh, Scion, that's Burry's firm. They had to file a 13D this year uh, because they took a position at the time greater than 5%. And within that 13D, I have it pulled up. They ha they included all their letters, all their communications with management and the board and so forth. So if you pull up that 13D at the SEC website, you can look through all the letters all in one place. You could get these elsewhere too because they were press releases, but I kind of like having it all in one place. Um, so check out those letters to the board. And also because there was the, the board vote back in June, they um, uh, they shared their opinion on uh, GameStop back in June. So it's, this is their latest viewpoint at the time. They still, even though they weren't, they were below five percent. They still had four percent position, which a good a good sized position. But they shared their latest view. So this was as of June. This was only a month ago. So Scion st still seems fairly bullish on this. But I really like I really like Barry's letters because they they get right to the point so quickly that um, the whole thesis is right here in this latest, not maybe not just this letter, but the whole thesis can be found in just these letters. He does a, he's a, does a great job of, of, of communicating his points so succinctly. Um, but anyway, I bring this up because that's his latest commentary on the company. And besides Scion, you'll also want to check out what I said, Hester and Permit's letters and their restored GameStop presentation. So Hester and Permit, I think they own like 7-8% of GameStop right now. The activist investors, they were the ones trying to get board seats. But uh, they've had a number of letters back and forth um, over the past couple of years now. But they, check out those letters too. Um, they have a lot of thoughts and good thoughts on GameStop. Um, and they also have this Re Restore GameStop presentation. This is from May 2020 where they, they, they put together this presentation to try to help them to share it with the investors and so forth, help them get the board seats. But it's like 80 plus pages. Like how much can I add to an 80 plus page presentation? Not much. I'm going to reference this a couple times in this video. But check out this presentation because a lot of the thesis is covered right here. Um, and then, yeah, so let me just pull this back over here. All right, so that's some recommended. Also, the Seeking Alpha articles. I think I have it open here, Seeking Alpha articles. Yeah, there's a, sometimes you come across a company, there's not that many articles written, or the ones that are written just aren't that good. GameStop has a number of really good articles out there. And um, I'm biased. You don't need to tell me this, but in my opinion, the, the bullish articles uh, here, the bullish authors, they seem to be more attuned to reality than the bears, I think. Maybe you disagree. That's cool. Let me know. But I think they seem to be more the security analyst type. This is going to come up later in this video, but uh, check out the articles. A lot of the stuff I'm going to say, it's already been covered here. So that's what I mean. I don't have much new to say. I'm just sharing my viewpoint. So check those out. But yeah, I think 
that's just about everything. So some recommended reading. So you read all that stuff. You probably don't need to watch this. But if you are going to watch this, let's keep moving forward. So like I said, there's a lot of aspects of it, a lot of moving parts of this bull thesis. But I boiled it down to just what I consider the three overs. Digital risks seem to me to be overblown. The negative sentiment is overdone. And the value uh, is overlooked. In fact, I think <laughs> the GameStop stock is, uh, I mean, it epitomizes value investing. It's like value investing at its finest because it's such a classic case of, um, of, of value investing. We'll get into it later. I don't want to spend too much time on that, but it's just a classic value stock. And um, I think that's why it's so polarizing in my opinion. But okay, so let's get into the digital risk overblown. So um, I, the tra this transition to digital, I think it's just much slower than what's being priced in. It seems to me that um, um, it's been happening over time. I do think it's inevitable. Like if we're looking out 50 years, 100 years, we don't need to have a discussion because I'm on, uh, we're on the same page. Everything's going to be digital. I just don't think we're there yet. And this is meaningful because 2020 is when the consoles are coming out. We, it does matter where we are today and where we'll be the next couple of years. You can't just say we're going fully digital. So that's the end of the discussion. And I think that's what a lot of people are doing. I'll touch on this later too, but people just go digital is the future so there's nothing to be had here with GameStop there's no heat there's, there's no future um, but I don't think we're there yet I mean it's, it's just it's, it's transitioning much slower I have some web pages pulled up here just to so I think I, I try to let me just keep on going with these bullet points I just list them before I start pulling up some other websites but people just say I, I mean physical discs there's they still remain a good size chunk in 2020 that's part of what I'm getting at I also think in-game purchases they're kind of skewing some of the figures that people are sharing like they'll share some figures which I'll show in just a sec if they say this is what percentage of the market is digital right now, but I think those in-game purchases are kind of affecting that. I'm not certain, but that's okay because I'm a value investor. I don't need to be precise. Um, and then why discs? But before I get to why discs, let me just share some of the things. So if you Google like physical versus digital, you're going to come across the Statista webpage. And like you see stuff like this and I, maybe other people are and... And you see, I highlighted this part in contrast, only 17% of video games were sold in physical form. And you see figures like this, and you see the trend too. If you look at the trend over the past five years, it looks really alarming. And I did this, so people see this and they think, oh man, GameStop's toast. But um, I, I think there's just some misunderstanding with that data. I think a lot of that, like I said, is, is, is in-game purchases. I think the actual outright purchase of discs is still relatively high. Um, and I have, um, let me just see what other page I got up here. So to counter this, there was an article in May 2019 by uh, Wedbush Securities. I mean, maybe they're biased too. Maybe they're bullish on GameStop. But, but they talk about a number of things that like kind of counter that point that everything's going digital. Like sales of uh, the FIFA game was still 75% discs in 2018. I don't even know the accuracy of that. I, I see the report that they're citing. But this is the thing. You're going to see lots of data. And as an individual investor, it's hard to know what's true and what's not, what's accurate. So you kind of just got to read a lot and try to get a feel for this type of stuff. And um, so check out this article. It's, it was in Variety. Check this out because they kind of counter a lot of this stuff. Whether or not you fully agree with it, that's another thing. But just read it. And then there was another thing here too in GameIndustry.biz where they talk about, this is more a European focused, where they're talking about certain countries, um, what percentage is, is digitized, what, what, what percentage of... Um, games purchased are physical and so look over this I don't want to review the whole thing that's not the point of this video but just check out these sources where this was 2018 2019 it's 2020 right now and the trend is clearly going toward digital but this is my point is that you're still seeing some countries that are still heavily skewed to physical and I don't think one year later all of a sudden everyone's going to be buying digital so that's the thing is because these next few years are critical for this GameStop thesis and so if there's still a good chunk that's physical games GameStop sells other stuff too but I the software itself those used games what everyone's focused on because um, that generates a lot of free cash flow. that in particular yeah I just check these articles out now I know I'm rambling a bit but I got to keep going to keep this quick what else did I have up here oh and then like so there was a um, uh, this articles from June 2019 it was an interview. It was it was on the verge, but they were talking to um, the Xbox boss Phil Spencer, and um, so this I'm like trying to piece together the story as to that's what I mean. It's so hard to know exactly what these numbers are, how many people are still buying discs. So I like try to look for stuff that piece piece together the narrative, um, and so Phil Spencer was saying, I want to give this was last year. I want to give people choice and right now physical is a choice that millions of people love so this is the xbox phil spencer and they he, saying this last year that's me that should be meaningful to people when you tell me no one's buying physical anymore if xbox um uh is, is saying this or the people in charge of xbox are helping lead the charge of saying that's like you should pay attention to that 
Um, and if you remember back in 2013 when they were rolling out the Xbox, uh, there was some c confusion over the console and they kind of messed up a bit. And then they had they wrote this blog. Um, I forget the, the, the story itself, but you t then they had to say like this. They had to walk it back. You told us how much you love the flexibility and so forth. And uh, with, with games delivered on disc, they had to start offering um, the, the disc version or start trumpeting that even more because people wanted that. I get it was 2013. It's changed during this console cycle. I get that. It's not lost to me. I just mean um, that, that Xbox kind of realized that they're like, all right, people still want these discs. And I still think that's the case today, 2020, to a degree. Maybe not not as much in 2013 because it has indeed changed quite a bit, but it is still it is still relevant. Um, and was there anything else I wanted to point out? I had a couple of web pages that I pulled up. I showed that. No, that's it. That's it for this. Oh, and then just the general physical versus digital case. Now, because it's it's July 2020, the consoles are coming out. You're going to see a lot of YouTube videos of people debating this. Should they go physical or should they go digital? And there's a lot of good videos out here. And, uh, and in particular, uh, Fanta, I haven't seen all your stuff yet, but from what I've seen so far, you have a lot of good thoughts on this. I mean, I know you're not a security analyst. That's what I mean. A lot of people are voicing their opinions. You have a lot of um, spheres crossing paths here, like gamers and so forth. And uh, I agree with a lot of stuff that Fanta is saying here, but he brings up a lot of good points. Um, but then, and, and also these other ones, he's got a couple videos too. Um, but um, um, there's a whole number of videos out here, and everyone seems to be leaning a bit more toward physical when you watch these things. Um, I just find that interesting. Like, why you hear digital, 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 but then you see these videos and people kind of talking more about the benefits of physical. But you can find it both ways. You can kind of find whatever you want to find in here. But in this video, I brought this one up because this gentleman he's leaning more toward uh, digital. And but then you check out the comments. Everyone starts talking about the disc version, disc version. I want the disc version, disc version. Disc, just about every comment. Not maybe not every single one, but like this, like this is. What I'm trying to piece together that story, right? Um, so when I see stuff like this, I just find it interesting. All I'm trying to figure out as a value investor is, is there any, is, does there remain some demand in 2024 of those discs? Because that's important for GameStop's, um, the, the um, free cash flow, the gener free cash flow generation. So look, check this stuff out for yourself. I'm just not, we're not going to watch these videos right now, but I just encourage you to check it out yourself. If you're, if you're trying to build your own thesis around GameStop. And then, um, so why discs, uh, Preference, console storage, trade value, download speed, sharing. I don't even need to. I'm just. It's covered by the uh, Restore GameStop presentation. Um, this the what we're getting at here is that there's still consumer demand for GameStop's offering. So let me pull this over here. And let's just scroll down just a couple. This is what is this slide 80? I think. Um, and, and just GameStop retains mind share with customers. Now this is all quoted from one single survey. So this is the stuff, stuff I look at. Where are you getting this data from? Um, is this demand legitimate? And this is what I mean. I'm not basing everything on this one single data point, but um, this is the stuff I like to see as a, as a value investor because I just need to make sure that GameStop isn't going bankrupt in that uh, people are still buying discs and that there are still demands for GameStop for just a couple of years because if that's the case, um, uh, GameStop is likely undervalued. So the point I'm just showing this is that GameStop, um, there's still interest for uh, it, it's, um, some or many of its products. Um, and then digital downloads have slowed share gains over time. You can see this this chart too. Check just check out this presentation, right? But I'm just I'm just trying to make my point there that uh, it's not over yet. In 2020, it's not over yet. 2030, yeah, maybe it will be, but not yet. Um, Anything else? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So this is a list of the I've kind of put together that list. It's um, you can see this here, too. So it's interesting I, that people are downloading games isn't lost on me. Right. Because I, I have friends, I have family and they think I'm crazy that I'm bullish on GameStop because they the, many of them are downloading are downloading games. And so that's the thing. you got these anecdotes. You're talking to people and so forth. And maybe you you're I feel like most people watching this are probably downloading games. Um, I think GameStop might serve a different target customer where um not everyone has an Amazon Prime account. I have that up. Uh, what is it like? Um, yeah, what? 112 million members of Amazon Prime as of December 2019. <clears throat> that's not every like. Everyone just thinks, oh, you just buy it on Amazon. That's it. And uh, but like, not everyone has an Amazon Prime account. No, some people do want to shop at brick and mortar. Maybe they want this. I'm, I'm just listing stuff that's already here. They want the trade and value. They want these things. And that's not to say that you have these things or you want these things and so forth or that these are an issue for you. Perhaps they're not. I'm willing to bet that they're not because if you're in a situation where you're watching this video, um, then I've, yeah, it just depends. I, I don't have time to get into all that right now. But 
Um, yeah, so that's the way, why I think digital risks are overblown. I still think physical um, is here for at least a few more years. In particular, this console cycle, I still think it's going to be relevant. And I think that physical disc version is, is going to outsell the digital version. Let me know what you think for the, for the new Xbox and PlayStation consoles. Um, all right, so the next one is, let me move this back out of the way. Negative sentiment is overdone. So this is some of the heaviest negative sentiment I've, I've seen uh, with the stock. I um, just about, I mean, it, it, there's just so many different ways people are negative about GameStop, about its stock, about its, its future business. And so I just jotted down a couple just for fun. Uh, these, are, these aren't all true exact quotes people have said to me, but haven't shopped there in years, or my friends haven't shopped there in years. You can download everything. Digital's the future. GameStop's the next blockbuster. That's a popular one. People just, they say, oh, GameStop's a po possible investment. They go, oh, no, no, that's the next blockbuster. And then they just move on. <laughs> they go, that's the end of the discussion. They, they, no one wants to look under the hood. Um, the terminal value is zero. Um, with the poor managerial decisions, they like blame past managerial decisions as a reason not to invest in GameStop. Brick and mortar is dead. Anything brick and mortar is a bad investment. So, so Amazon, that's the end of the discussion. <laughs> Just say Amazon. Anyone, if Amazon can compete with you, then you're dead. And then, uh, and then the pandemic. So there's some, there's some legitimacies to some of these things. I'm not saying I'm not saying that these things are all ridiculous. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that that it's just so much of it that I think that's a a, a part of the reason that it's it's weighing on GameStop GameStop stock price so much in uh, July 2020 because it's really heavy. It's really heavy to get out from underneath that. It's a reason part of the reason you see such heavy short interest as well. Um, but I think this is so. This has led to an opportunity. That that's that's what I think. But um, yeah, so just so much negative commentary. I just think that this sentiment is so negative that it's it's overdone. That's what I'm trying to get at in this section. And also with these GameStop bears, I you read some of these articles or some of the some of the commentary on this, and I think people because they themselves this is what I was trying to get at too. They they seem to falsely impute behaviors to others. Like they themselves not but might not be customers of GameStop, or if they have bought physical discs, they have the ability to to resell it on eBay or something like that, or they just download everything. And I think what happens is the people who are opining on GameStop as an investment, they're the, they're the loudest, right? But they don't, they're not, they're just not customers, or they are their, their friends or family on customers too. And when that ha that reason, when that happens, they they, um, I don't know, maybe they're not digging deep enough, or maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I might be wrong about this too, but I think people are thinking that everyone else behaves the way that they behave. And uh, I think that could be a mistake in this case because from what it seems to me that they're are still people shopping there? There remains demand, and just because the people talking about it don't have it doesn't mean it's not there. I think, I think this is my thesis. You're welcome to to tear it to shreds. Feel free. I encourage you to please it, comment on this video or talk to me on the live stream about it because, I'll, as you can tell, I'm really curious about this. And also, many of the people who are who are negative on GameStop, they don't seem to be security analysts. Uh, and you may, you, some of you may think that may not matter, but it does. Like this is the opportunity for like a value investor is that. Yes, I'm analyzing a business model, right? I mean, that's important. For some people, that's all that matters. But when you're analyzing a security, like you, you can have, I don't think GameStop's terminal value is necessarily zero. But even if it were, that doesn't mean GameStop's a bad investment right now. And I think that's lost on some folks because they're not bona fide security analysts. And so if, let's say you, you've been right about the industry the past five years or so, maybe you're just a, a gamer um, or... Um, an investor who's just reading some of the headlines and you see the trend towards d digital and you and you can you kind of like all right this is probably inevitable but you don't look, start looking at the hood you're not looking at the balance sheet you're not looking at historical uh, free cash flow margins or, or what to expect in the future or something like that and i think if you're not a security analyst and in digging into this stuff it, it gets lost in you that doesn't mean the security analysts are always right we make mistakes and we might be wrong on this one but when i see that when i see a bearish say seeking alpha article out there um, and I read through it and I think, no, this isn't, this doesn't, this isn't like security analysis to me. You're, you, you know, you're not, tell, you're not telling me the things that I want to hear. If I, if I were trying to build a bearish position on the stock, then I think, all right, then that's something to be wary of. I, my, 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 uh, I, I perk up a bit. So yeah, that's it. That's just this negative sentiment just seems so heavy. And I think that's why we're, we're where we are today at, uh, I mean, sub $4 in July, 2020, Whew. That's that's surprising me. Maybe earlier this year and last year and stuff, but so close to the console refresh, that's something. That's something. Okay, so then finally, value is being overlooked, I think. Oh, I would like to keep this on the same page. I, mean, I need a drink. I'm just going nonstop, you know? Um, all right, so 
So because of these like first two things, I feel like um, no one's looking under the hood. I already said that, but there's a lot of things that are happening fundamentally that um, that that one could be excited about, myself included. So like there's a new board of directors, um, there's a new management team. And so that's what I mean. People criticize GameStop's historical decisions, their poor acquisitions and so forth, um, and maybe um, yeah, poor operational decisions, whatever it is. But it's like, all right, cool, cool. Yeah, that's that's fair. But we have a new manager team right now. Not, not to say they're going to hit it out of the park. That's not the point. The point is just that it has changed. And so far, I have to say they seem somewhat, comp somewhat competent. Um, I mean, they just hired, got Reggie to the board too. I feel like that's big. But the, then you got Sherman for the management team. He's only been here just over a year. He's just getting started. He needs a little bit of time. I know Bari, he voiced his opinion on the new board seats and he he, um, he wasn't in favor of Hester Perman. I kind of get that. I, I I don't, it's a marginal impact on the, the bull thesis. It's okay that Hester Perman, they, they seem like they, they, they know, uh, they get their finger on the pulse. I don't think it makes that big of a difference, but I kind of get where Bari's coming from because it kind of feels like management's been doing some good things over the past 12 months in the right direction. Um, and we'll get to some of this stuff as I work through this bullet point list. But I just mean so far from my pers from, from it just looks like they're, they're competent, they're doing the right things. And as a value investor, you, you, you need to see that because if they don't, you kind of need stuff to go. You need a lot of a lot of stuff to go right. I don't want to say that, but it's just an important element of, of this type of a thesis. And uh, one of the ways they've been showing that they, they, they know what they're doing or that they're seeming competent is they've been cutting costs. So they talk about cutting costs. It's one thing to talk about and it's one thing to actually do it. They seem like they're doing it. Though. So um, they're, they're cutting costs. Um, um, in fact, I, I, while I go, while, part of what I'm, I want to do here during this video is I want to review some of the fundamentals. Um, and we'll get to this, but I just want to review a couple more things as I do this. Ah, sorry about that. Uh, they've got the reducing cost of goods sold, so it seems identifying the stores, testing it, um, uh, and, and improving working capital management. Um, a lot of people talk about this, but they seem like they're actually doing it. Um, th they can make better capital allocation decisions. You can see them selling assets, actively testing stores. Um, they're not making any dumb acquisitions. Like you, you like this, this, this is just stuff that it demonstrates to me that they're on. They could be on the right path. That um, they could be. Um, like when you're selling assets, like in this year, when it's a, it's a tough year for GameStop and they're selling the jet, selling some, doing some sale leaseback, um, um, some sale leaseback things just to generate a little bit of extra cash. That cash goes a long way right now. And, um, and of course, testing the store, that feeds into longer term things, right? But that, this stuff's important. And then improved flexibility they have right now because of the refinancing, they extended the maturities and they got rid of some covenants. Like I'm, I'm listing a whole bunch of things here that, but like I don't how not enough people are talking about this stuff. This is what I mean. Like the stock price, it seems it's gone nowhere for twelve months. But the fundamental events that have been unfolding are like objectively positive. I um, it, things are they've been incrementally improving, and that it, that the price is still flat is surprising to me. Um, they have adequate liquidity now to uh, to get through the console refresh and for a potential turnaround. It might be still too early to that. When I say potential turnaround, I mean like re revamping their business model to be like they could be here in 20 years. Right now, I'm not sure about 20 years. Right, not many people are, but they might have enough liquidity, especially to get to the console refresh and can generate some extra cash. They might be in a good position. Tough call, but definitely enough liquidity that I don't. People talk about GameStop going bankrupt and stuff. I, I, I if you're saying GameStop going bankrupt, you need to you need to. Sh you need to show your work on that one because I don't see it at all. It highly, 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 highly unlikely to happen. Um, I, I it's hard for me to take those types of thesis, that that type of a thesis seriously. So um, I'd be I'd be wary of that. Um, anyway, GameStop still remains highly relevant too. They got uh, six billion in revenues at the tail end of a console cycle. They have one billion during the the um, latest quarter Q1. Look at this. This was they they had to uh, um, they had, were de dealing with the pandemic end of a console cycle they literally had to close their doors and they still generated a billion dollars in sales like a billion dollars and then I talk to my family and friends and they go yeah no one shops there anymore I'm like how you do a billion dollars how you do a billion dollars and anyway I know free cash flow is what matters but still that's telegraphing to me like people still shopping here and yes everyone see everyone will focus on the year over year declines right here let me drink a get a beer here. But um, it's just that sheer level that sticks out to me first. Um, yeah, so um, let me get back to this. So I like to see it. Six billion in revenues is legit. That's a, that's a good size. That's a good. Size. Sometimes you come across a company and might only be um, like a billion in revenues, two billion in revenues, two, two billion in revenues, especially like a retail company. And I think, all right, well, it's, um, it's 
they're going to fall off a cliff tomorrow. And you might say GameStop's revenues are currently falling off a cliff, but if you're still at a billion dollars right now with a new console cycle on the way, that that that's um, that's legitimate. And um, yeah, six billion is a good size. Is good size. Um, okay, so then they have significant operating leverage because of this. They're trading at just four percent of these revenues. <laughs> You don't see too many companies trade at 4% of, of revenues with this type of a financial situation. Like usually you see that, and you, often when you see that, companies might be going bankrupt in the near term future. And like I said, I think that's highly unlikely with GameStop. So 4% of revenues with a new console cycle, I think, what the hell? What? And so anyway, if the things just go a little bit right, then that, that operating leverage can lead to a, a, a huge rise in the share price uh, due to um, a realization of what fair value is. All right, so then, and then just the company's been historically successful at generating free cash flow. This is the the next um, item that I had on that list. If we just pull up simple free cash flow here, I, in fact, let me scroll over to just these are this side over here. Uh, ignore the conditional formatting. I didn't clean it up, but uh, if we look at simple free cash flow, this column, this row here, that's operating cash flow less capex. Look at they were generating half a billion dollars there for a couple of years, and uh, it's just been historically positive. This is rolling 12 months, so this is through Q1 2020. If you look at fiscal year um, 19, got a little bit wonky because they were aggressively uh, paying down um, some accounts payables, and uh, they're trying to work on working capital. They're definitely close to burning cash right now. I, we don't need to get into the the specifics, but anyway. But if you go you go to the rolling twelve months and you start seeing they've been positive, generating positive free cash flow this whole time. Um, really impressive. You don't see that too often, and it doesn't mean it's what's going to happen in the future. It just mean it just sticks out to me. And then generating five hundred million in that type of I call it simple free cash flow. That's um, that stands out to me. So yeah, and despite I think that I know Hester and Perman comment on this too, but I think they've had bloated costs in the past. I think SG&A selling general and administrative expenses seem to me pretty high, and uh, they probably could have been doing a better job of managing that working cop working capital. I think that previous manager team was just a little bit lazy on that front. They were kind of just r riding riding the wave of the business model, and they weren't really trying to do a diligent job of managing the operations. And so they were still generating a ton of free cash flow. <laughs> it's pretty pretty impressive. So. Um, so yeah, I, it seems to be overlooked a little bit. Okay, so then, and then right now, 260 million market cap, give or take. And I think let's, it, it, this is trading at what I perceive to be a discount to the fair net asset value, to fair book value of around 400 million, give or take, plus a conservative estimate of future free cash flow. So this is why I spent a little bit of time on uh, in this video. I don't know where I'm at right now and time-wise, but let's just dig into this just a little bit. Um, just take a peek at the balance sheet. And when you look at the balance sheet, like doesn't it stick out to you that cash position of 570 million to a market cap of 260 million? Like holy shit, right? I mean, you don't see that that often. Um, usually, when you see that, it's it, it paints a really dire picture for the company, and maybe that's why this price is is in the gutter. But it doesn't deserve to be, in, in my opinion. And I think people are, might be thrown off by some of these things. Um, and the accounts receivables. Uh, let's says so the thing. So if the company's not going bankrupt, we can assess these things with GameStop being a going concern. And if that's the case, you don't need to discount them too heavily. So when I'm right, I'm pulling up this balance sheet just to assess the quality of book value. So right now we have book value of about 435 million. And the question is, is that a legitimate? Is that a fair estimate of what book value is if the company were to like sell all these assets and distribute it to shareholders? It's not a true liquidation. I'm I'm not I don't want to do a liquidation analysis because I don't think the company's going bankrupt. I just want to. Just a quick assessment of uh, what what their assets are currently worth. So that's what I'm going through. Like cash, you know, that's a pretty legitimate value there. 570 million receivables, also pretty decent. Um, you can you can kind of bet on that to a degree. Maybe 50 million, 60 million merchandise inventories. You see the big uh, decline in inventories. They've been trying to do, uh, been working on um, improving their working capital management and. I like to think I have. No, I don't like to think. I, I, it would be nice if the inventory that they're selling off has been the lower margin or. Um, um, inventory in, in less demand and so forth. So it's, it's only higher quality inventory that's left over. And actually, if you look at the 10K, this is Q1, but if you look at the 10K and you start going through the footnotes and analyzing the inventory, it kind of looks like that a good chunk of the inventory, the majority of their inventory is higher quality inventory. And by that, I mean newer hardware, newer software. And if that's the case, um, that it might, this inventory dollar amount might be pretty pretty accurate. And some people look at GameStop inventory and they go think, oh, oh, that's used games. That's probably not what, worth what it's on the books as. But this stuff's carried at costs. Even those used games, the older used games that they have, 
if many of you may know, they're they're paying a, a, a small fraction of what they ultimately sell it for. I know people complain about that, but it's covered in the books at that cost that what they paid for it. So even if it might not be selling at the sale price, they hope. In theory, you'd think that they could potentially get in the ballpark of cost. Maybe not, but that's what I mean. And if the inventory is, is indeed higher quality, newer and so forth, then that inventory figure is probably in the ballpark of reality. And prepaid expenses is a going concern. That's probably a, a fair value of that. Maybe a slight discount. Assets held for sale. I think that's the jet, but they sold it like the week later, so that's done. Um, and I mentioned the the warehouses and the distribution facilities that they're they're hoping to do a sale lease back on. Um, that uh, it's it's not it's not under assets held for sale. It's it's elsewhere, probably under property and equipment. But um, that's another thing that's held for sale right now that will uh, generate some cash. Just something to. That's the thing. I didn't toss it on the bullet point, but there's another there's another cash generating thing that they're doing. Um, that's gonna this balance sheet's gonna be modified. It already is modified, right? It's almost um, it, we're in July here. Q2 is almost over. But um, yeah, um, forget the leases. I don't want to get into leases right now. It's uh, I disagree with how they're handled on the balance sheet. It, it kind of interferes with my analysis. And um, there's a contra account in the liability section. We don't need to get into this now, but. Um, Deferred income taxes, that has value um, as a going concern and so forth. And then other non-current assets. And I don't know where it's in here, but they also have the Game Informer magazine, which, uh, I mean, I don't know how much that's worth. Everyone, like, it's, I get, I know Game Informer magazine. You automatically get it when you're a subscriber to Game, uh, uh, to the um, to the, the, mem the GameStop membership account. It, by the way, they have 42, I should have mentioned this, they had 42 million members. I think that's what Hester Permit's uh, presentation said. So when people say people don't shop there. It's like they're, another reason they're incentivized to shop there. They have that membership, which gives them some some perks and stuff. But forty two million. Anyway, um, they um, along with that membership, they get the subscription to to Game Informer, and maybe not everyone reads it, but something like I think I have the. Do I have it up? Yeah, here it is. Okay, so the uh, Game Informer magazine. They have yeah. Look at this. So this is the top um, uh, uh, subscriptions in in the United States in Game Informer. Um, number five on the list with six million in subs. So, um, yeah, like I said, I, I know not everyone necessarily reads it because you get it with the membership and so forth, but that's a lot of eyeballs on there. I mean, even if a fraction of them are reading them, and then you see something like Time, number 13. I think that sold for a couple of years ago for just under 200 million, I think. I had looked that up recently. And um, in Time, I mean, people are subscribing to that and I'm, I'm sure it's generating probably more free cash than game informer again if if, if people uh, i don't know what the breakdown is for how many people are paying for that subscription and stuff nor how many are reading it and so forth but if time's getting close to 200 million and uh i mean what matters is if game informer is making money right i get that part but it seems like an asset for one of the uh, a thriving industry like gaming and you got one of the top magazines it's a question of how much it's generating but nevertheless we can we, it, it that the, the, the name brand itself probably has some value. So it's just another asset that could, in theory, potentially be monetized. I just I don't know what the value is, but I don't need to. This is the good thing about being a value investor. It's like my default, like, ah, well, okay, it's on the books. Just because you come across so many companies where they don't have these assets, they don't have levers to pull. That's what I'm trying to convey here with GameStop. They have levers to pull, and uh, this is just another example of it. So I'm not sure where it is on the balance sheet. Uh, maybe this other... Maybe property and equipment. I'm not sure, but it's on there. That's on there. And then you get to the liabilities, and all the liabilities are pretty fair. Accrued accounts payable, uh, accrued liabilities. So actually, some of these are probably like, is it this one? Game, like gift cards and stuff. Like, that's what I mean. Like, that's kind of a, it's a legitimate liability, but kind of a soft liability. Um, and then the operating leases, we can forget about those. The current portion of long-term debt, this has already changed because of that bond exchange they did. Um, yeah, they were able to extend the maturity a couple of years, and they got rid of some covenants because of it over 50% uh, agreed to do it. And that's just, that's huge news. And uh, and um, because it gets them to the console cycle, and it gets them to the point where they could potentially have much more free cash flow to navigate their their uh, their situation. But uh, anyway, so it just it's changed. And... Uh, the line of credit. Also, they have some unpaid rent too. We, we mustn't forget that it's in here somewhere. Somewhere probably accrued liabilities and stuff. But um, but they have the the revolver too, which is almost certainly changed now that it's July. But um, all um, uh, some other long term. Okay, moved into new other long term liabilities and then total. Anyway, so as we work through this and we look through all this, then you see book value of about. Also, I like to see sorry retained earnings of that 1.3 billion. They've since had write downs, right? Because all those acquisitions they had, they wrote them all down. Probably some inventory and stuff. 
but I'd like to see good retained earnings because it proves the company was at some point historically, <laughs> at some point profitable. Um, so that's what I mean, legitimate business model historically. Anyway, now you see stockholders' equity after major write downs and stuff. Um, that's the thing. If you hadn't seen major write downs, then you might think that there might be some on the horizon right around the corner and stuff. But we already have them, at least, especially the soft stuff like Goodwill. You should just assume Goodwill is just a future write down when you see, especially if a company is battling risks and stuff. But now at 435 million, um, I know it's not a liquidation analysis and stuff, but uh, that's it seems to me in the ballpark. You get that fat cast position too. So yeah, it just seems to be in the ballpark. So it's meaningful because the market cap's at 260 right now. So not a bad margin of safety. But in addition to that, there's also the opportunity for future free cash flows, right? So if I pull up this, um, this is my the, one of the fundamental spreadsheets that I have. And um, this is where I perform the analysis. I know I just had this open, but um, let's just poke. Let's just look at a couple things in particular that stick out to me. I mentioned the revenues were at six billion. People will focus on this year over year decline, right? It's alarming. That's a fair point. It is alarming, but people are overly focused on that. What I'm seeing is just the share level, six billion, but also the historically fairly stable revenues, surprisingly stable. Um, but nine billion. It's a big company, good sized company, I should say, not a big company. But uh, also, but also noteworthy is it, it was fairly stable through the last console refresh, right? That's that matters. Um, and then you have the switch too. Sometimes these are staggered. The switch was a couple years back. That's stabilizing things a bit. But um, but anyway, you you see this big drop down in this year. I think because so much is going on, tail end of a console cycle, um, people withholding purchase and so forth, and the pandemic. Um, but I think this big drop down, as opposed to it being fairly stable, like I don't. As opposed to it being fairly stable, I think you might get a big jump next year, year over year. Maybe. I don't know. I'm just theorizing. But um, so anyway, that's what we should be focused on. And then we also got to, I like growth. Look at check out gross margin. So gross margin is a good one because usually with companies that are deteriorating, everything's falling apart. You see gross margin deteriorating as well. Like cause they can't management can't control costs. They're losing control of stuff. But uh, check out gross margins like holding up fairly well. This is three year average. But uh, even the three-year average through 2020, 28%, it was only 27% in 2012, before, at the, uh, right before the uh, last consoles, uh, the last console cycle ended. And so that's pretty good. They're keeping it together. And if we scroll over and start looking at individual individual years, we see gross margin 29% this year above the past two years. So even the, despite a huge sell-off, a, a huge decline in revenues, gross margin is holding up pretty well. And uh, I see that and I think, okay, all right, that's that's important to see right now. But also, is management doing a good job right now of of um, focusing on higher margin stuff? Perhaps. That's what I'd like to say. If this were down another year, I'd be like, oh, I'd, be le I'd believe less in the new management team. But it's holding up okay. And like I said, it's even, I mean, it's on par with where it was in 2014 and above 2012 and stuff. That's okay. That's good. But then you see SG&A, another important expense. To, I, I, I focus first on gross margin because like those costs are, can be diff, more difficult to manage, I think. But SG&A, I feel like this is a, a, a more easily fixed problem. Um, and if you see this, I mean, it's been ballooning in recent years. It used to be 16, 17, 18 as a percentage of revenues, right? Um and then it's been increasing past couple of years. Part of that is because the denominator is declining, right? Revenues are going down. But um, it's not that alarming for me because it, it's fixable to me. I, I feel like you can, um, and I think PE firms are noticing this too. I think a lot, and all the activists talk about this too, but this is stuff that, um, that could be improved. So it's not that I'd be more concerned with with gross margin deteriorating than I would be SG&A margin. Um, and yes, I see this big jump up and you see new management. Well, how come new management isn't reining this in? There's a good question. They need to. Maybe this, I think this could take a little bit more time to, 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 to bring back. And especially because of such a big decline in revenues, we'll see where it at, it's at in the coming years, but something to keep your eye on. Um, all right, so that's it. And then, then simple free cash flow. So I already brought up simple free cash flow, right? But let's focus, if we're trying to do some forecasting, just some light forecasting, I promise, I promise it'll be light. I think it's helpful to let's look at sim simple free cash flow margin. Forget the aggregate numbers, but if we look at what it was over the past over the past cycle, right? This is through to, um, May third, twenty fourteen, through today. This was that seven years. We see an average. If you go down here, go to average on Google Sheets, an average of three point four percent. But for those first couple of years, you saw an average of uh, four point nine percent. But you obviously <laughs> you cannot forecast that into the future. Um, but I like, nevertheless, that's a good starting point. That's what I mean. People start, 
that's the starting point. You need to look at how a company has performed over the uh, over the past, and then I think and then try to determine how has the situation changed from how it was performing back then. There's a, been a, a meaningful change the past couple of years. This shift to digital, right? That's meaningful, um, and it's so much so that uh, not only can we not start using five percent free cash flow margin. I don't even think. Oh, obviously, the past couple of years it's been um, um, much lower, but I don't even think three point four percent should be used. Uh, for forecasting, I don't even think half of that should be used. Like, I wouldn't even use 3%, 2%. I wouldn't even use 1% because as a value investor, I'm just trying to make sure my downside is um, um, is protected. And for that reason, I don't want to I don't want to be too optimistic in my forecast. So I've, I, I propose that we use like 20%. I've been thinking 20% of what that free cash flow margin was. So instead of 3.4%, everyone get your graphing calculators out, right? Um, 0 0.034 times 0.2. 0.68 percent. Now, now we're 0.68 percent. That's on. That's lower. That that's almost. Is that the lowest? If I if I add a decimal place there, can I do that? 0.59. So it's not the lowest, but it's pretty low. 0.68 percent. So if we forecast out 0.68 percent simple free cash flow margin moving forward, then it's also a question of which what revenue should we forecast to try to get what the future free cash flows would be. So at this point, we're using the, the that figure so we can look to revenues. We just got to forecast out revenues. That's what I mean. We're just using a simplistic cash flow analysis here, simple free cash flow margin, um, uh, revenues, what do we think revenues will be moving forward? We could say, oh, get back to 8 billion, 9 billion. I think no way, right? There's no way you can forecast in a taking back out the previous highs. In theory, it's possible. I don't even want to go down that path because I don't, I'm not concerned with what's possible. I'm concerned with what's probably most likely. Um, and so, I don't even, so you could, maybe we'll see a jump. Maybe we don't get back to eight. Maybe we get back to 7 billion uh, or maybe we get to 6.5 billion. Remember I talked about a potential leap. This is through uh, Q1 though. Through Q2 and Q3, we should see continued declines in revenues. It will be lower than this. So I propose for forecasting, we, for, if we forecast, I've been thinking like 5 billion in revenues over six years, like, or if, let's do six years. Um, in that, it'll be all over the place right but if that's our average revenue figure then that'll that's a, that'll be a, a number we can use for each year and i think that's do you think that's decent do you think that's too high does anyone think that an average of five billion through the first six years of a console cycle is too high for gamestop when they used to be it's almost it's not quite it's not half of what they used to do but that seems to me somewhat conservative um as does the simple free cash flow margin we mentioned of 0.68 percent so if you use that i've already i used the online calculator just to keep it simple, if I wanted to um, to do this precisely, I do it in a spreadsheet, but I just whipped this up really quickly before I kicked off this video. I don't know if this calculator is accurate. It doesn't matter because I can eyeball it and I know it's roughly in the ballpark of, of reality. Um, so what I said was I took those, I did simple free cash flow margin of 0.68% times uh, 5 billion over six years just to keep it simple. I know it will fluctuate and I get it. Um, and then I just bounced around the uh, cash flows a little bit. It all averages out to 0.68%. Um, so 0.68% times 5 billion is about, I think, um, was it 35, 34? 34 million. So this averages out to about 34, 35 million. And then I just, maybe second year, they'll have the most blah, blah, blah. And then I use a discount rate of 20%. I feel like that's pretty conservative for the risks that are um, we're, we're, we're dealing with here. Um, maybe you think it should be higher. Let me know. Let me know. But using those, using these assumptions, at least I'm showing you my assumptions. This is what I mean: is that I see some bearish, um, some bearish GME comments and articles and stuff. I think I oh, just show me your numbers because I want to try to uh, compare it to what I'm getting. Maybe you think the company cannot generate positive free cash flow moving forward. I feel like a lot of people might think that. But based on all that stuff that I showed previously of um, this of all these things that like the fundamental events that have been unfolding positively and, and why I think some stuff's overdone. Like you would have to explain to me that man, you'd have to say management cannot get a control of this stuff or physical, we'll, we'll, they'll have zero interest within a couple of years of stuff. You'd have to be pretty bearish. Like you'd have to, for this to be, for this, for these numbers that I used to not be conservative, you'd have to have the mo like one of the most bearish outcomes that could possibly happen. Doesn't mean it can happen. It absolutely can happen. But uh, it just seems unlikely that that's what's, what it's going to unfold so if this unfolds then you have present value of about 125 million plus the book value of about let's just call it 400 million that's what i was trying to get at here then you're getting at 500 million that's twice what the market cap is that's twice the market cap and so that's what i think i think about gamestop i think it is 
it is at least a double. I think it is probably a triple, but it legit could be uh, a four to five bagger. It could be looking out, I don't know, looking out six to 18 months or so. Um, yeah, so that's what I think. If you disagree with that, that's fine. I, I Like I said, I've been wrong about plenty of things in the past, um, but I just, I see Heston Permanent, I see Scion's analysis, and I see my own analysis, and we, that we all, I, it strikes me as we're security analysts, and we're looking at this, and then I get really, I don't, so I mean, I try to come up with why it's trading where it is, because I'm really confused, because I feel like other people, either we're all wrong, or everyone's looking at the wrong stuff, and if they've gotten the wrong impression, which I've seen happen before, but this is, this is something. This is something because it's some of the biggest, it's one of the biggest misperceptions I've seen in a while, I think. Ever? Maybe. I don't know. Um, maybe not ever. I don't know. But, um, okay, so that's that. So let me know if you disagree. And if you think they can't generate positive free cash flow, I'd be interested about that. Like, if you think they're done and that this is it and that they cannot do it, that that's, that'd be interesting to me. So let me know. Again, either in the comments to this video or, um, or let me know on Twitter or in the live stream or wherever. The other, the other, we talk about fundamental events, right? So this is the thing you, you see in my other videos. I do, uh, I'll do some technical analysis and I incorporate that into my approach. But if you're really trying to make some big gains and stuff, uh, where you make the most money, it's through fundamental analysis. Positions like this, where I'm digging into the details and I'm using technical analysis to to facilitate the position. Sometimes it is my focus. Sometimes technical analysis is my focus. But I'm not making the biggest money on on that type of a position. Um, that's why you see me digging through a lot of the fundamental stuff because it's a bigger position. Just because a position's in the Roaring Kitty model portfolio doesn't mean I'm spending this much time on all the positions. It's just the ones that are of higher interest to me. Anyway, now to just pull up the chart. Do I already have it open? I think I do. Um, right there. So here, what is this? This is let's do the monthly chart because it's a monthly chart. Technical analysis. They see this. They think, oh, this is terrible. Especially last year, they saw this. They, you can't touch this stock. You can't touch this. This looks terrible. It still looks terrible from from the perspective of many technical analysts. Although you can see the RSA turning a bit here, it's starting to level off. Nevertheless, it was. Oh, and this was with. Let's see if we do. Oh, if we do the, um, we can adjust for dividends by doing this. I like to do this sometimes. So a dividend adjusted, we were over $50 back in 2013. And remember, oh, I didn't even mention, just remember those share count. That I, when I said things that have kept my attention, the share count, it's been it's been halved. It's been halved since the uh, the previous console cycle. So something to bear in mind when you're looking at these historical prices. Um, and they also have enough cash and authorization to purchase another $100 million worth of shares, which could get the share count down to $40 million. I don't think it's likely right now, but there's a case to be made that they should. So just something to keep your eye for. I don't think it's likely right now, July 2020. I don't think it's going to happen this year, but it's a possibility. If it happens, look out because, um, yeah, because that's uh, it's going to change it even more. When you're buying back shares, it's so important to buy it back below, um, I mean, book value per share or, or fair value per share, more importantly. And because I think fair value per share is quite a bit higher, I, it can be a good thing to buy back these shares. And if they do it, it increases the per share value even more than it would otherwise. So something to keep your eye on. But um um, sorry, I lost the chart there. So here's the chart. Chart doesn't look, good. doesn't look that good in the monthly, but starting to flatten out a bit. You see the RSI moving up. So if we switch it down to weekly, just a three-year weekly, now it starts to get kind of interesting because now it's starting to build a base, right? Look at this. Uh, again, it was looking kind of sketchy last year, and then it comes back down. Then it had that big sell-off. But this is the thing: when you're looking at a chart, you can't look at it in isolation. Everyone should, everyone who analyzes charts should know this. I see this, you think, oh, look at that big sell -off. what happened that week? And yes, it, they did report earnings that week, but everything was selling off that week. It was a double, they were retesting uh, companies like GameStop and um, some some so some of the companies I deal with were retesting the lows that week, um, that first week of, um, last week of March, first week in April, they were retesting lows. Anyway, GameStop bounced right back. It was only one week down, then it comes back. Now it's flattening out around four bucks. So I see this, I think it's building the base. Um, doesn't mean that's how it's going to work out, but I just mean... The longer that base, watch out because it could it could take off. And then you look at a one and a half daily, and then uh, you get to here. If you can get to five, maybe they fill the gap and stuff. Ah, we don't need to get into all that. That's not the point. That uh, obviously this is a fundamentals focused thesis, right? So why am I even pulling up the chart just to show that things kind of feel like they're changing a little bit? And because if if the chart does change a bit and it starts to look more bullish, you got other people who are piling into into it as well. Just not just the longer term fundamentals focused people. That's why I kind of look at this stuff because I know other people are too. And if that chart turns, um, it's just people could start piling on. And then you get the short interest too. I didn't want to go into, hopefully it's clear the short interest wasn't a, a isn't a, a main point to this thesis, but you need to acknowledge it. It's out there. Could it be unwound? 
in a systematic manner so that nothing happens? Yeah, probably. But this is, I, mean, I don't know enough about the mechanics of the market to, uh, to be sure about that type of thing. I'm not betting on a short squeeze, but it seems like something where it could take place. Although I think if you want a real short squeeze, you'd probably want a more levered company where people were truly like it was on the verge of bankruptcy and then it suddenly it's not. GameStop, I don't know. I, we just got to see what happens, but it would be nice if it goes up really quickly. But when you see all this stuff kind of adding up, you need to at least consider it, take it into consideration. But uh, yeah, if the start tart, if we get closer to, the, this is what I mean, we're in July, the console cycle is right around the corner and it's still priced in the gutter. It's pretty impressive to me. But next couple months, maybe a sentiment will start to turn, chart will start to turn up. People start seeing that, uh, I feel like if people start seeing Barry's involved too, that could help because um, he's a legitimate, successful value investor, knows his shit and see the activists and the management's making moves and stuff. Uh, maybe it could happen in the, uh, the this by the end of 2020, but um, probably within, the thesis should unfold fully within 18 months. If it doesn't happen by then, I don't know. I do think GameStop's gonna be, seems likely to me it's gonna be bought out by a PE firm who sees what I see and thinks, all right, we, let's take this thing private and start, um, we can start taking out the free cash flows and stuff. I think that'll happen. It, they, it almost happened a couple of years ago in 2018. And at that time, it was priced. It looked like the it would have been bought out between one billion and two billion, something in that range, one point five billion. Since then, the share count's been whacked quite a bit. So, if that were fair value, then we're looking at a much higher stock price. But when would it ha when would it happen? A couple two years from now, a year from now. At this point, I don't think it's going to happen before the console. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen before November. So I don't know. I think it's I think that's where this company's going, but I don't know the timing of it. Um, but yeah, a lot 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 a lot of moving parts here. So I think that's it. And then finally, just some things that uh, that I don't think are even, I don't even talk about them because it's not a big part of my thesis. I'm just trying to make sure GameStop's still relevant and that it can generate some free cash flow. But there's a whole bunch of um, upside potential that's 100%, seemingly 100% discounted. Even I discounted myself because I can't, except for the first one, extended interest in physical games as compared to like music and movies and stuff because people compare it to that stuff and say, oh, it's going the same way. But um, I mean, as long as there's interest in uh, November of 2020 and for the next year or two, then GameStop's likely going to generate free cash flow in my biased opinion, if you want to call it that. But I mean, what if it what if it goes on even longer than one or two years? What if it goes five years or 10 years? Um, because people want those physical games. I mean, it's, it's, that's a similar case to movies and DVDs. But, um, excuse me, DVDs and, and, and CDs and so forth. But what if um, this console um, storage limitations, could that persist? Games will only get increasingly complex over time. So is there a case to be made that they'll get so complex it'll be difficult to store 200 games on a system? Then you got to delete them and stuff. It will be simplified longer term in the future. But I'm just thinking five years. What if there's still quite a bit of physical demand looking out five years or 10 years? 20 years? Ugh. Mm, I wouldn't bet on that. <laughs> but five years? I'm like, all right, could be. 10 years? Maybe. But probably not as much. I, I, um, anyway, that's just, so I'm just pointing that out that everyone's pretty much pricing in this, this. Right now, people are pricing in that there's like no interest right now, which I think is a really aggressive bear case to make i how i don't understand how anyone can be short gamestop at four dollars that is really really risky really risky and yet you see a huge short position i think that's the bigger firms trying to generate some extra income but i'm like oh my i see this i think what are you thinking what are you thinking short and gamestop at this price point right now a couple years ago okay maybe if it rises again but right now what oh you're pricing in like a really apocalyptic scenario for GameStop, which could happen, but I don't feel, I wouldn't feel comfortable betting on that. So that's what I mean. If it's if it's even just a little bit better than that, that's not being priced in. Then Burry mentioned and other people mentioned two higher margin revenue scenes via vendor partnerships. I don't even know what that looks like. Um but Barry mentioned it, so that's a possibility. I know they got Reggie on the board too, and they've been talking with Microsoft about stuff, but what what are the details? What are the details of that? What could that be? Could someone team up with GameStop so that it, it changes the business model a bit? So that it could it could it could survive even longer. I don't know. Um, I'm not really pricing it in, but I know it's a distinct possibility. Um, and then just if they do, what if those test stores in Tulsa work out? They become something. And I, I know with the pandemic too, here they are trying to build a social gaming hub and stuff. And uh, but this is a thriving industry, and GameStop's the only brick and mortar retailer, only retailer dedicated to well, brick and mortar retailer dedicated to it has a presence. And um, seems like there could be something there. I don't know if there is, but can you imagine can you envision it i know people can envision it i'm just saying for this bullet point list here that i'm not saying is a big part of the thesis as is hopefully clear at this point of the video but it's a possibility a distinct possibility that you at least should talk about and if stuff stuff like this ever happened then if you're looking out two three four years gamestop could be uh, the stock price could be quite a bit higher especially after all those share repurchases and so forth um 
So yeah, there's just additional things that could be that could be factored in. I think that covers most of the big items. Um, I, uh, I, and again, if you check out the other uh, the other commentaries and, and letters and so forth for additional information, I covered some of the ones that I consider more important to me. There's other things too. Maybe I did miss something important. I don't know. I'm losing track. But uh, yeah, let me know your thoughts. If you'd see a blind spot or if you think I'm missing something or if you strongly disagree with stuff, like especially my forecasts and stuff, or you think I'm, I'm blindly bullish or that I'm... I'm I'm, I'm biased and stuff. Yeah, let me know your thoughts and uh, in the in the comments of this and the in the live stream and Twitter wherever because I want to be sure I'm right about this. I feel like we are, but been wrong before. So I, I I try to do as much analysis as I can to be as confident in the position as possible. So that's it. I hope you like this first video of the the, the kitty corner here in in GameStop and let's see if it's an, an exciting final few months of, of 2020 and. Um, yeah, tune in for more videos about other companies. Probably won't be as long as this one, but I'm hope, hoping to share my thoughts on some stocks just to give you some insight into where I'm at with things. But uh, that's it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you around.